I'm Kevin Jones, Fitta Museum Curator. Welcome to Creating the Costumes of Spencer with renowned costume designer, Jacqueline Duran. We are thrilled to have you all join us this evening. It is now my pleasure to introduce our esteemed guest. Uh, British costume designer, Jacqueline Duran has won two Academy Awards for Best Costume Design for films Anna Karenina in 2013, and most recently, Little Women in 2020 and has been nominated seven times for the award. She has also won three BAFTAs, which is the British Film uh, Academy Film and Television Arts Award, uh, as well as a Costume Designer Guild Award. Jacqueline received considerable attention for her work on Pride and Prejudice, and is also well known for films such as Atonement, Mr. Turner, Darkest Hour, Macbeth, Beauty and the Beast, and many more. And I have to say, we're very proud that we have had examples of all of her costumes from these films in our past annual Hollywood costume exhibitions. Her most recent work can be seen in the much lauded film, Spencer, which is inspired uh, by Princess Diana's decision to end her marriage and uh, leave the British royal family. In this pre-recorded conversation, you'll learn how Jacqueline developed and designed the signature costumes for the cast uh, which includes Kristen Stewart as Princess Diana and Jack Farthing as Prince Charles. After the interview, stay logged in to see unique connections between Diana, Princess of Wales, and the Fitta Museum's permanent fashion collection. Thank you again for joining us. And now we have Jacqueline Duran and Spencer. Well, hello, Jacqueline. This is uh, wonderful to be able to talk with you again uh, via the magic of Zooming. And because uh, I'm here in Los Angeles. And where are you exactly right now? I'm at Leaveston Studios, just north of London. So um, it's on a completely different time zone. It's dark here, evening. Right. Um, yeah, and we're in yeah, the morning. It's great to talk to you. It's great to yeah, it's, it's been a while. Um, we hope to uh, have you out to Los Angeles again sometime soon. It'd be wonderful to have you in our galleries again. Oh, I'd love to. I came, was it last time, maybe four years ago? I think so. I yeah, think it was so. definitely, uh, it's been a while, so we need to get you out here. Um, I'd and, very much like to visit, so. And I'll tell you, I am a huge Diana nerd um, ever oh, since I was a little kid. So I was really excited uh, about this movie. And I, I, I got to see a, a screening of it and it was absolutely wonderful. I was in trance the whole time and it, it felt like it went by very quickly for me, uh, which is always a good sign. And of course, I was completely concentrated on your costumes for Kristen Stewart's character as Diana, uh, because I was fascinated as a kid um, with her clothing and of course becoming a dress historian. Uh, it's just kind of this perfect uh, parallel for me personally. So I, I really appreciate you joining us today to talk about what you did for the film and how you developed um, each of these characters and looks based on a very, very iconic person. Mm. So it, I'm just going to jump right on in yeah, with my first sure. question. And do you have a research philosophy when you approach a film? And specifically for Spencer, um, did you talk to family members? Did you talk to former staff? Did you go to museums to look at any of her actual clothing? No. The thing, the thing about the Spencer movie was it was very much an unauthorized look at her life. So it felt a little bit uncomfortable going to the, um, approaching the, approaching the palace or approaching any official um, lines of investigation because it it was it felt like it may not be the kind of film that they wanted to make. Not that in any way we intended it to be disrespectful or or in any way you know tarnish Diana's reputation or image or anything else. But it was just because it's a fable about her life. It's not trying to be a documentary or trying to replicate exactly what happened in any particular way. Then. I, I just didn't want to take that that route, but I did fantasize about the fact that somewhere there must be a book where someone has written down every item of clothing that she's ever worn, because I imagine that they must record right. the detail of each costume that she ever wears on an official visit. I mean, it just you just 
just imagine that would happen, wouldn't you? Yeah, so I just didn't involved. imagine if you could get hold of that book and you could see the exact sequence of things, it would be amazing. But no, what I decided to do, it was it is daunting because she's so photographed. Like I couldn't actually have believed how many photographs there were of her in different costumes over this reasonably short period that we were looking at. Pablo told me at the beginning of the project that he that it was set, he didn't have a precise date. Obviously it was Christmas, so if he gave the year, then it would be precise, but he didn't. He right. said it was somewhere between 90 and 92. And so I decided that the thing to do would be to look at her clothes, look at pictures of her, as many images as I could, as I could, between 1988 and 1992. And so I try, I scrolled through hundreds, maybe thousands, who knows, but trying to see themes in what she wore so that I could kind of break break into it in a way and see ways of approaching condensing the looks so that we got the essence of what she wore at the, in that period but obviously over a very short period of time we didn't have so many costumes to tell that story so I wanted to condense um, you know themes in her look and kind and of put those into the movie. And especially because you were really in just in one setting too it's not like yeah. you were in multiple multiple locations all over the world and things could change and yeah. be visually interesting because yeah. of just change. Yeah. yeah, there's no change. You're in the house. It's always winter. There's no, there's no variety there. And so it, I really wanted to kind of, I wanted to capture the idea of what she looked like, but at the same time, not specifically um, replicate what she was wearing on those dates. Though you could do because everything is recorded. So we could have just done the Sandringham costume that she wore on that date in 1992, but we didn't want to because we didn't want for our story to be pinned to anything that was exactly fact. Because it's it's a work of imagination, not a work of, not a documentary. Right. How many costumes did you actually end up creating uh for Diana's character, but also maybe as a whole with all of the um, supporting cast? I just can't remember that, to be honest. I, I mean, I, I, can, I can run through probably in my memory the order of her costumes and say which ones were made and which ones weren't. I mean, pretty much all of the costumes that were in the main story we made apart from the ones that we were loaned by Chanel. So we had that relationship in, in the story, but we, everything was made apart from the incidental costumes, which we called the montage, which are the things that Pablo, the, the kind of running sequence and other flashback sequences to another period of time, like right. memory. So those, those I had to buy or rent or look for, um, otherwise we made. The thing is, it wasn't a very big movie. It wasn't a big budget movie. So you had to find ways around, you know, finding the costumes, making them, you know, having enough, you know, spreading yourself across the story. Pablo right. did this slightly terrifying thing, which was to say that he wanted every single day of the shoot, he wanted to shoot her in at least one montage costume, which meant that you had the, the story arc of, the movie, which was, I think, I can't remember exactly how many costumes, maybe 15, but then you also had 35 other ones <laughs> that he wanted to shoot on a daily basis. So it was a lot to try and work out. Did you have any concept while you were on set about the, the kind of present day Diana and then those montages, fantasy sequence, how that they were going to jump back and forth in the no. film? as a way of keeping track of what you were, were going to present on screen? No, it was quite complex, actually, because you had the two things running in parallel and you didn't quite know how the unscripted version would work. So, so even when you're normally doing a costume plot, you have, you know the sequence of events, you know mm -hmm. that the costume follows this costume follows this costume. But right. you, with the montage, it was a kind of wild card that you could never know whether it was gonna, where it was going to jump in. That was that was kind of the thing that Pablo 
was working on himself and it wasn't scripted. So you just had, but then you just sort of had to let it go. And not only that, you had the, the whole question of the clothing rail and the allocation of the costumes and all and that complexity mixed in with what she actually wore and the montage. So it was this big three-way thing, which actually I hadn't mentioned that, is that we also had to do a rail of clothes which were 50% remained unworn, but had to be believably things she would wear. Yeah, so in fact, I mean, <laughs> until you just mentioned that, I didn't even think about the entire mm -hmm. rack of clothes that, yeah. would, that was carried around yeah. and uh, and Diana herself within the film was trying yeah. to mix things up and not wear them as yeah. they were prescribed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you had that, you had the fantasy version of what she could have worn over the arc of the weekend. You had what she actually wore and they overlapped to a degree. And then you had the other thing. So it was pretty complex. It was, yeah, it was a lot of things to think, to kind of juggle in your head. And also I you have to keep it free because it isn't a documentary, it's, it's a creative work being pieced together by Pablo and Kristen. And you want to give them the freedom to experiment and move and you know, change things and it, for it to have life. So you really needed to kind of just be juggling all those things and not kind of becoming oppressed by them. I have to say that uh, one of the aspects of the costuming that you did that I liked very much is that it was really obvious when it was Diana as Diana, the princess, the celebrity, the, the person on show. And then you had Diana as mother with her mm -hmm. kids mm -hmm. and how she dressed and moved around. And then Diana, when she was outdoors yeah. um, and how she would dress as anybody would dress in those cold environments in the wintertime. It was really interesting um, and really helped to place instantly the character and to give you a sense of the, the mindset of, okay, this is Diana acting. This is mm. Diana being herself. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that was a very important part of it because it was really important to see that kind of undulation in her life and style and the kind of pressure of, you know, the public event and the pressure of, you know, that rigid, you know, list of clothes that she has to wear that someone's lined up for her she has to perform all those functions and and that just kind of hanging over her and then the times when that wasn't the case and she was just able to be herself and be a young woman and yeah that was a really important contrast in the movie and it's something that it was it, it fell naturally because we were looking you know scene by scene at what would be appropriate but it was a really important thing and, and yeah, I mean, both were interesting experiments, but they, they were, it was a balance, you know, it was just as interesting trying to work out what those, you know, Diana's own personal wardrobe was, as well as her royal wardrobe. But it was so interesting, though, because in, in this setting, since they were at Sandringham, it's a very, it's a vast estate, it's private. That's what was so striking for me is that she still had this royal wardrobe in a private setting with the family that was prescribed and it's yeah. just that's one of the things that helped to make it feel so oppressive yeah and they're absolutely. beautiful clothes anybody would love to wear them and dress up like a party but it became psychologically so damaging yeah and it, and it is i think that is you know a key part of the of the fable you know the the story you know you may have all the things you think you ever wished for but actually you know it those things oppress you right and it's it, yeah, it's a fairy tale. It, it, mm. Well, um, I, I'd love to talk a little bit about your interaction with uh, Kristen Stewart, who's an American actress mm -hmm. playing a British royal. And how did you have everything prescribed? Did you force all the costumes on Kristen Stewart? Or was there a collaboration, a work? How, how exactly did you work that? Well, the, the process that we went through was that I met with Pablo um, possibly the beginning of November. It was, it was very quick. And we talked through, I'd, I'd put this the thematic reference together, you know, as much as I could. So the different way, the different themes that ran through her royal wardrobe, you know, the colours that she wore, the contrast she had, the fads, all the things that we know and we associate with Diana. 
So I'd been through that with Pablo and he'd marked things that he liked that he, he responded to. And so I got a kind of sense of the way he was looking at Diana. And it was during COVID, it was a mm. nightmare. The travel was impossible. Even getting clothes was pretty impossible, to be honest. And um, so Kristen was coming into London on um, the, at the beginning of December. And we just pre we prepared the whole kind of costume wardrobe in, you know, in twirls and, you know, unfinished some pieces, just, just so that we could talk through the whole movie, really, because we had so few opportunities to be together during prep that we just had to plan it all out. And it's also part of Pablo's process because he is there at the fittings and he photographs things as you go along. And he, he works with that, I think, on his own in, in forming his ideas about the movie, how he's gonna shoot it, and our, you know the work of us as a team of collaborators with him. So he was there at the fitting and Kristen flew in and we, we just started at the beginning and we just fitted every single costume. And it was an, an immense nine hour fitting. Wow. And Kristen, Kristen was truly amazing because she didn't lose focus. She didn't, she was obviously tired. She, I'm sure she was tired by the end, but she, it, there was no sign of that. And we just worked through it. And we discussed each one. We discussed where the costume, you know, what I prepared, which scenes I prepared it for, where it might work. You know, we, Pablo photographed it. And it was just one of the most constructive fittings. You know, it was, it was really great. And we, we were just able to move forward with pretty much everything um, from that fitting. And we had one more giant fitting in London in January before everything got shipped to Germany. because That's where we shot. Right. And Pablo um, photographed, that was the time when he really used the photography to photographing the costumes and then planning out the position of the costumes in at different times in the movie did did all of your planning work out or were there any hiccups that you had to suddenly really kind of scrap a dress or have to bring in something that that you hadn't planned or hoped for we had there were a few things we changed the color of a dress hmm. so we had to quickly remake that which was a nightmare because the fabric shops were shut <laughs> Oh. So everything was just, you know, you know what, it, I mean, I'm sure that LA was pretty much the same as London. Yes. You just couldn't get things, you know, you'd, where you would normally just pop down and get some fabric, the shops were shut. So you had to go through this kind of whole process to try and get a piece of fabric. Um, so that was tricky. And every, you know, workrooms were smaller. We didn't have a workroom attached to the film because it was too small. So I was using out people working in different workrooms and, you know, it was tricky. People couldn't work in the same way. Anyway, um, so that, yeah, I had to change the color of things. Nothing really changed. What happened was that the order moved around. So ah. the kind of crazy wild card yellow costume yeah. bounced around, not knowing exactly where it was going to land. And then it was actually during shooting that it landed on the scarecrow and it was just the perfect place for, for that costume to be. But it had originated, it, there was something about it that Pablo liked because it, of the pirate hat. She, Diana wore a version of this costume to review, I think a naval school or something, somewhere in England. And we just, because of the process that we used where we just took things that Diana wore, but then kind of changed them. So we, we changed elements and we, this was originally a dress, but it became a skirt and jacket. The pirate hat was somewhat like this, but almost the reverse. And so we just, we twisted things around just to make it so that you couldn't pinpoint the moment that, we're, that Diana wore it. Because in a way it's distracting. If you are looking at this movie, but you know Diana's clothes and you go, but hang on a minute, that's the thing she wore to right. the naval yard. It would, it would throw you out of the story. Right. But at the same time, you want to pick up on those things that are recognizably hers and use them so that, that as a, an audience member, you look at her and you think, yeah, that's like a Diane, that's something Diana could have worn. So it was about taking things and, and kind of owning them for our movie. And since we're yeah. looking at right now, the, the yellow ensemble, I did notice that color was very significant for the costumes because it seemed to be when Diana 
was playing Diana. She had to be the royal. She had to be the public mm -hmm. person. Even, you know, if she was within the private estate, mm -hmm. it was very bold, clear, solid, almost primary colors. Yeah. But yeah. then when Diana was being really her own self, mm -hmm. she was very muted and she yeah. blended yeah. into yeah. herself. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That was, it was the, the royal clothes are very much about presentation and kind of being the center of the room and you know calling attention to yourself and then really retreating from that when when mm -hmm. you're in, in a private space but as you say her private space never really existed it was it was no. always potentially public yeah right right um let me nerd out just a little bit because okay. i have one specific question for you now as a nine-year-old i woke myself up at two o'clock in the morning to watch the wedding live Oh yeah, and uh, I was just thrilled to death. So for the wedding gown, and it's it only makes a brief appearance in in the film, and it's in kind of a fantasy scene. I'm just curious why there's an extra seam going around the skirt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm calling you out. <laughs> shall I tell you? Shall I? Shall I be? Shall I be completely honest with you about this costume? Yes, please. <laughs> because. Exactly as you say, the, you know, on our small low budget movie, Pablo, I mean, how could he do this to me? Throws in that we need Diana's wedding dress in the montage. <laughs> like, there's no way I can afford to make the wedding dress for the movie. But neither can I hire it because Pablo says, well, she may be running in the woods. She may be out in the fields. If anyone had a replica dress, they would never let me take it out into the countryside. So we had to make one. And we decided that the best thing to do was to buy an 80s wedding dress okay. and then add the sleeves and the neck and just do something that we know is not correct because we can't do it. Yeah. But, but you just have to kind of believe that this is, this is our kind of, it's almost like a placeholder of the wedding dress right. because we just can't afford to make it. Um, on for this tiny scene so that's why it is and, and the thing is that not only that is that I would never have bought the dress if I knew that scene was there but they'd hidden it under some sort of awful kind of ruched piece of fabric which I just imagined had been laid on but actually it was hiding a scene so then I was like oh my god anyway, <laughs> to do it. so yeah I'm, I'm in a way I'm glad that you brought it up because I don't want anyone to think that I thought that that was you know, a full-blooded replica of the dress because it obviously isn't. Right. But you know, sometimes you just have to, just have to do what you can do in the movie. Well, thank you because uh, you know <laughs> that just stood out to me, and it's not that it would stand out to everybody, no. but uh, you know, um, yeah, <laughs> thank you. And it, and, yeah. and it also plays into honestly what the real workings are on a film. And yeah. but as a costume designer, you know, you can plan and plan, but then you I'm sure in every production you worked on, there are curveballs that come your yeah. way that you just have to make do with what you've got in five minutes. Yeah. That's exactly it. You know, there's no way that you can spend the amount of money and time that it would take to reproduce her dress. The crown for sure can do it. And, you know, and it's a big moment and it is the wedding dress. And right. it's, you know, it's important that that's as accurate as you can make it. But in our kind of impressionistic view of this story, it just wouldn't, we just couldn't have done it. And so, yeah, that is some, that's, that's the real world of filmmaking is that you just have to sometimes make things up. I remember that someone really at the beginning of my career when I was doing Pride and Prejudice, sent a criticism in saying that the uniforms for the soldiers were wrong because they were Waterloo uniforms. And the truth is, if you're not doing a military film, you have to hire the uniforms that are there. You can't make 250 uniforms that are correct for 15 years earlier, because right. it's just not that, you just can't do it. And so you just have to go with it, but there you go. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's realistic. Like, that criticism has stuck with me. <laughs> well, but as realistic as a film, might be it's still not the, we're not looking at the time period there have to be some yeah. concessions 
Yeah. And and even if they're not conscious decisions, you know, you look back at a film 15 years later and you can see your own time period yeah. blended in yeah. somehow. So I mean, uh, I'm sure, you know, the co the choices that I made looking back over that 98 uh, 88 to 92 period, I made choices about what we would pull into the movie, but they are the choices that you make in 2019, 2020. They're, they're Right. They're, you know, you're you're always in, influenced by what's around you and, you know, what you're looking at at the time and the colors that you're looking at. It's just inevitable, I think. So uh, Kristen Stewart, Diana, is 90% of the film. But there are also a lot of other family members that have speaking roles, but also family members that don't ever speak. They're not a potential, you know, they're not in the middle of the screen. And you also have a lot of the household staff outside individuals how did you uh, approach all of those other characters um and i wondered specifically because i'm i'm i i thought of sarah um prince andrew's wife yeah. and she is only ever seen on the fringes yet i saw her red hair and i'm like ah mm -hmm. that's sarah yeah. um does the how close do you work with the makeup and hair? And sometimes is the makeup and hair more important than what's being worn to define a character within well, a group setting? They were, they were very difficult characters. I mean, there was a descending order really of, the, of how much we saw them on the screen and how, you know, how fully rounded they were in the film. So, you know, Prince Charles, we saw quite a bit and mm -hmm. we made all of his costumes because that was just, we just needed to, we couldn't find anything that was his style. And we just, I just wanted it, the cloth to be really good. And I wanted him to have that specific coat that he has. And, you know, that was just something that we couldn't find and, and it was necessary to make. Even though we barely see some of the things, I, it was just necessary to kind of build his, his costume properly. The other, some of the other characters, Pablo really wasn't that, worried about how much they looked like the original that like the person they were representing so i i put wardrobes together most of the people that were not speaking parts had to have costumes that were hired mm -hmm. because that was the budget level of our film so i would trawl through the costume houses looking for things that would be say appropriate for sarah or appropriate for other members of the family and then I just put a, a group of clothes together and then they would be fitted from that because um, that, that was just how it was. And, and it wasn't something that was overly important, it, the, the looking like aspect. So to pick, up, to pick up style, the feeling of their style, but without having to reproduce things that they actually wore. Did you know where you were going to be filming and the settings, the, 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 the furniture, the wall colors? Did any of that play into um, putting together those uh, group scenes? Yes, it did. Um, Guy sent all of the paint colors because I was prepping it in England and it was shooting in Germany. So it was a cross. It was very difficult with COVID, as you can imagine. Right. So he sent all of the paint colors and, and I knew the palettes for the different rooms. So I knew that in, when that scene was taking place, it would be taking place in this colored room. And, and that was also part of Pablo's method of photographing the fittings was to check the position, check the costumes in the settings. So to, to kind of liaise and pull all that together so that we knew where things would play. Obviously right. some things play through different set, you know, they go from the bedroom down the hallway to the, right. so that's a, a moving thing. But yes, it was very important to always have the context of a costume. Did you have a, do you have a favorite costume or was there a costume that you just, you're like, oh, I'm, I can't wait to get this one solved because I want to move on. <laughs> I I liked the plaid because it was, it was, it, I think it's quintessential Diana. And yeah. it was actually very hard to do because I couldn't find plaid on that scale. I even, I even contacted New York fabric shops everywhere I was looking to try and get this fabric. And because it hasn't been fashionable for quite a while, the scale of the, of the plaid was just difficult. 
to find, you know, that bold stripe across here that mm -hmm. you can see in the picture. And so I finally found one piece in Cyprus wow. online. And I was like, oh my God, so Cyprus. So they sent it from Cyprus, but, and it sort of seemed like it might be enough. It was, I think it was a three yard piece or something. And we were like, oh, maybe. And then obviously because you're matching the checks, it, it just takes more fabric. So when, when the cutter had cut it, there was literally like tiny pieces left. <laughs> and, um, and it was just, a, it was, I was just thrilled that we'd actually managed to find a plaid and make a jacket. And, and I, I like it because Pablo chose it. I didn't necessarily know that it was gonna be the costume that opened the film. But he, he, in his ordering it in his head, said, I think that's going to be a great way to start. So, so it became that costume, and I liked it. I, I just felt it was a strong start. That's fantastic. And how interesting it was w one that was going to possibly prove incredibly difficult to pull, pull together, find what you needed, and then it becomes a star piece. Yeah, exactly. So, so it's, yeah, it's a happy thing. Yeah. At, the, at the beginning, before you had really even started bringing together your research or looking for the materials that the costumes would end up being created from, did, did Pablo give you any kind of restrictions or directions? Or did he say, Jacqueline, what's your vision? Um, how, did, how, how, how did that come about? I think he pretty much did. I think he... I think he left me to, to look through it and respond to her style and to think it through and mull it over. And, he, and I think coming up with the themes that I did, I think was, was him letting me, was letting me present to him different directions. And then from those directions, he would choose, you know, what he, what he, you know, he would say what he responded to from the range that I offered. Um, he didn't really know he 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 was more responsive to whatever we put forward mm -hmm. than he was in any way prescriptive well, and there are there are some things there are some things actually that she wears that were purchases that were just towards the end when she's in her own clothes the the kind of bomber jacket that she wears on the beach that was a purchase and the blazer that she wears when she's having the KFC with the kids yeah. is a purchase. Uh, the jeans are a purchase. So that when we were moving into that territory, there were some things that we didn't make that we that we found, which were happy, happy. Well, found. the the stone washed mom jeans, <laughs> literally spot on, because that is a very specific cut for it that is, late eighties, early nineties. Yeah, <laughs> I know. And the, and the slightly short leg and the right. little pumps and everything, yeah. yeah. And, the, and the OPD cap. Because one of the things as well is that we didn't want to, to, as I said, reproduce the specific costumes that could be recognized and would have played yeah. elsewhere in her life. But there were moments when we just dropped in some things that were absolutely accurate, like the OPD cap. Because one of the reference pictures I had was her at an airport wearing the long blazer, the gold buttons, and she had the OPD cap. So we said, should we just do the OPD cap? You know, why not? Let's just drop those things in that are actually accurate, even though they're random and they're, you know, they don't necessarily play in our story. Let's just put them in. Right. Well, um, we only have a very specific amount of time. And unfortunately, okay. it has come to an end uh, so quickly as it always does when I'm enjoying uh, <laughs> talking with you and, and about a really interesting um, topic that has so many details that, you know, it, the, our, our students, thank you for them and for our public uh, for giving us details of the behind the scenes because it really even helps to bring the movie and your characters more to life, understanding what it takes to do the, the art form that uh, you have so well honed. So we thank you very much. No, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you. And we look forward to uh, hopefully having you out to the Fitta Museum again. And we are very excited that we will have costumes from Spencer in our upcoming Hollywood costume exhibition, which we have not had. You know, we've been closed for almost two years now. So we're very excited Amazing. to be opening up again. Do you know which ones you're... you're displaying 
We, I, we don't, I don't at the moment. If you have any specifics, we'd love to hear it because we want to uh, show off what you want uh, us to, to have for our students so they okay, can learn great. the most. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So okay, we'll talk. great, I'll, I'll do that. Great, thank Terrific. you. Terrific. Thank you, Jacqueline Duran. Thank we very appreciate much. your time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And thank you again, everybody, for joining us for my uh, pre-recorded interview with Jacqueline Duran. I had the best time. She is such a lovely person, and uh, we've been able to uh, communicate back and forth uh, many times over the years, and it's always a pleasure. And uh, I do, though, want to show you a connection with Diana uh, and the Fitta Museum, because uh, one of our founding donors is Betsy Bloomingdale of the famous Bloomingdale's department store family. And she uh, donated the very first couture clothing to us uh, in 1977. And she was one of the people that was actually invited to the royal wedding of Charles and Diana in 1981. And she wore this or uh, kind of an orangey peachy and green Silk Couture, this is Marc Boan for Christian Dior. He was the longest um, uh, fashion director, art director for House of Dior. Um, 30 years was his career. And she, he and Betsy were very, very good friends. And he custom created this ensemble for her, including the hat that she's wearing. The photo shows the ensemble. So it was the, the dress with a, with a separate belt. And then she had a matching kind of a cape that went over it. And uh, you can see in the photograph that she is there with her husband, Alfred Vanderbilt. This was actually the last public appearance of Alfred before he passed away not too soon afterward. But uh, the hat actually was also created by Mark Bowen for Betsy. And we have that in the collection as well. And what you can't see in the photograph of them is that Betsy pinned a little gold and diamond bow brooch to the, um, the band of the hat. And it was given to Betsy by Alfred when they were uh, engaged back in 1946. So it was obviously something very special to her. And she left that on the hat all those years uh, later until she donated them to the Fitta Museum. So that's a wonderful um, connection that we have, which also, <clears throat> excuse me, includes the invitation, the wedding invitation uh, to the royal wedding, and even Betsy's luggage tags, because she traveled with Nancy Reagan, who was then the First Lady of the United States, on Air Force One, and they have very, very special luggage tags when you travel on Air Force One. As far as I, I've not done it yet, um, but uh, Betsy did, and she saved her tags, and they became part of the, the Bloomingdale Archive, which was donated to the, to the Fitta Museum when she passed away uh, by her family. So it's incredible to have all of the support documentation, including that very, very special gown that she wore. And what's also fun about that ensemble, she and Nancy Reagan were best friends and they had not um, talked to each other about the color of their dresses. And Nancy Reagan, uh, representing the United States as the first lady also wore a peach colored gown, but by Los Angeles designer, James Galanos, who dressed her for almost all of her official occasions. So it was great. And then I do have one more personal connection that I do wanna share with you today. As I mentioned in the interview with Jacqueline, I did wake up at two o'clock in the morning to watch the Royal Wedding live. And I was nine and over the course of the next year, so uh, until I was 10, I actually recreated Princess Diana's wedding gown for my Snoopy. And here it is, including the very, very long train. Diana's was 25 feet long. Snoopy's is not quite that long, but it's pretty long. And I even embroidered, um, let's see if I can get this, 1100 pearls onto uh, the gown itself. And I was very proud because I was looking at pictures of Diana and all the different books I had that I collected. And I created the patterns for the dress and created this. And my grandmother uh, even helped me to sew it. So it's something, you know, very special. Uh, so anyway, uh, I hope you enjoyed this evening's um, interview with Jacqueline Durant. We appreciate your support 
for joining us with these um, really incredible behind the scenes access to uh, the world's greatest designers.